and there is an Elastic Search user group. So you can Google it in the Meetup, and you can join. And probably maybe next year, or maybe before the next year, they we'll will see. make yeah they will make another presentation and another talk. Uh, so I, I hope the local community does one before I come back. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. So uh, enjoy the next talk, and thank you for coming again. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, let's see where we can take this. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Philip. Um, I work for Elastic. Um, you will see that in the slides. Let's do some monitoring. Uh, so I have some application, and I want to monitor that from all possible angles. So let's see how far we get here. Um, the idea for this talk came to me when I saw that tweet. Um, and unlike you like murder mysteries at work, um, maybe that is not the one you want. Because as soon as you have something that is distributed, um, finding problems, it's much harder than in the monolith. Like, I know everybody is bashing the monolith, but it has its, its distinct advantages. You can SSH into one box and see what is going on. If you have some highly distributed application, it's not that simple anymore, unfortunately. Um, so oftentimes, this is us. And we say, this is all fine. And then we continue. And at some point, you figure out this is no longer fine. And this is basically the point or state which we want to avoid. Like the bottom half of that, um, everything is on fire. And what the hell is my problem? We don't want to get there, basically. Um, we, we kind of want to avoid that. Um, so the idea of this talk is to log, monitor, ping, trace all the things, just to see what our system is up to. And we'll do most of that live. Um, hopefully, the demo gods are with us. So let's get started. Why am I talking about that? I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Kibana, Beats, Logstash. Um, I'm a developer advocate, uh, so I speak a lot about the good stuff that we do and just uh, speak at meetups, conferences, do trainings, solve problems on Discuss uh, or Stack Overflow, uh, and just try to help or solve problems. Um, so this is a, a Hello World application, and it is very highly monitored. I'm trying not to cheat too much. So we're using proper certificates, and we're doing the right things, but it's still a Hello World application. So uh, while you can take a lot of hints for your production setup, um, don't treat this as a production a application, because it is not. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, um, either shout out to me or um, Either open it up in your browser or just take a picture. Um, I'm using Slido, so if you go to slide.do um, and then Xera, um, you can ask questions there. If we have time at the end, I will answer them live. If we don't, I will just tweet out the answers to all the questions you put there. So whatever you have, um, both for this talk or a bit more generic, um, you can just throw some questions there, and I will try to answer afterwards. Um, by the way, did anybody figure out um, why I picked this weird-looking name? Any guesses? Um, it has something to do with my last name, which you can see here. Anybody has any idea what, what this is doing? Basically, if you take the letters of my last name and rotate all of them by 13, this is what you get. And the nice thing about 13 is if you rotate by 13 again, you're back at the original because, well, 26 letters in the, in the, in the alphabet. OK, so application. I have a very simple Spring Boot application just because I'm lazy and Spring Boot does every, all the work for us, basically. Um, but it could be anything else. I'm not doing anything very complicated. So I'm not using uh, a Spring Cloud or, or any fancy things. So that there's no discovery, load balancing, whatever. Um, I always say, um, if you have short names, it's also kind of a microservice. Um, if that is true or not, we, we could discuss afterwards. But that's kind of like, if somebody is asking you, are you doing microservices already, um, and you have short names, you can probably say yes, kind of. Um, so, so this is our excuse. And we'll mainly do this. Uh, basically, we have some services calling each other, and that's what we do. Um, so we run everything on AWS in the cloud. Uh, so we have the, the light sale instances. I roll out everything or configure everything on the cloud side with Terraform, and then provision my instances and deploy my application with Ansible. Um, you can see all of that in the repository, which I will show at the end, but we will not dive into the code for that too much. Um, we have our own cloud service um, where I run Elasticsearch and Kibana just because I'm lazy and I just want to use a service. Um, and yeah, since we provide that, I can just use that. And otherwise, or 
all the stuff that I'm showing today is open source, so you can just get it and play around with it and do whatever you think is the right thing with that. So this is our stack, and I'll just use three of our four components. So I'll use beats, which are like lightweight agents or shippers. They are written in Go, and they can collect information um, as efficiently as possible and just forward or ship that. It could be log files, it could be metrics, it could be JMX data, it could be some network information, it could be security events. It's all kinds of things that we're collecting. Um, we're forwarding that to Elasticsearch, which is storing everything, and then Kibana on top of it is just there to visualize everything. And we'll mostly interact with Kibana to see what we're visualizing. We still have Logstash, or we do have Logstash, and Logstash is not going away. Um, Logstash is just more of an ETL tool, so it can get data from various sources, transform it, enrich it, and then put it to Elast or store it in Elasticsearch or somewhere else. Um, but we don't really need that today. We'll keep it simple. We'll just use various beats, and you'll see all the beats that we're using. So this is kind of the, the architecture of what we have. Um, I have my cloud instances where I ship all the, the data and where I do the monitoring. And then I have three instances uh, running on AWS, front-end, back-end, and the monitoring instance. And I have a Spring Boot application on, on each one of them. We'll proxy that through Nginx, which does TLS and everything, uh, to forward that. On the monitoring instance, we have Sipkin running for the tracing. And then we have the various beats running on all the instances as well. So you can see we have audit beat for security events, um, file beat for log files, metric beat for both system metrics and application metrics, and packet beat for network data. And in addition, we have hard beat on the monitoring instance, which is basically a pinger to check, is my service up or down, and how quickly is it responding. Um, so that's pretty much it for the slides. Uh, let's see what we can do live. So um, if you've never seen Kibana, this is what Kibana looks like. Um, we can unfold uh, that here, and you see the menu on the left-hand side. Uh, we'll mainly stick to discover, which is like discovery of all the data that you have, visualize to see pre-built visualizations or build your own visualizations, and dashboard to put multiple visualizations together into one dashboard. Um, we also have, I have monitoring enabled, and what monitoring can show you, I'll collapse that now to save some screen space, uh, is can show me generally what we have on the Elastic Stack side running here. So we can see I have a three-node Elasticsearch instance, a uh, three-node cluster um, with these resources. I have one Kibana instance, which I use to just see what is going on. And then I have these 13 beats rolled out onto my system. And you can see, as we've said before, even though that is very small, maybe we can make this slightly more readable. Not sure it helps much, but let's try this. Um, so you can see I have my three instances, and on each one of them I have file beat, metric beat, audit beat, and packet beat running. And heartbeat is just running on one of them, because I only need my pinger on one system. Um, so this is basically the system that we have running. Uh, and now I just want to take a quick look at what my system looks like. So I head over to the dashboard. These are all, by the way, dashboards and visualizations that are pre-built. Since I'm lazy, I didn't build anything myself. Um, I've just imported the existing ones. And well, you can be lazy too and just reuse uh, what we have done. So what I'm interested in is I, I want to see uh, the overview of my system. So I'll head over to this one, and you can see I have my three instances here, so it's automatically collecting how many instances is this monitoring. You can see a resource usage, a CPU, memory, disk, uh, inbound and outbound network traffic. You can see how we are doing CPU and memory-wise. And down here we have a heat map of the CPU usage. So you can see mostly my instance is pretty idle. Like here we had minor spikes, but otherwise um, it's pretty OK. Um, now, you could click on one of them here and just dive into the details of one of these instances. So this is still pretty much like what you get from top or various other command line tools. It's just if you have more and more servers, you probably don't want to SSH into them and run top. This helps you just collect the information in a central place and then see uh, what it looks like. And here you can see CPU again, and then you can see here the memory usage, which seems very stable. Um, right now, I have filtered down to this one monitoring instance. You could also change that and say, I want to see all the instances. So if I, if I change that to a star, it will just show you all the instances that you have running. And here you can see some stuff is happening, um, even though I haven't really touched my system. So you can see these little red spikes here. This is ba basically that the memory is spiking. And I want to... Um, 
figure out what is happening on my system here. So for that, we don't have a very good uh, pre-built visualization, so I'll just start building a visualization myself now uh, just to see uh, what this is doing. So for that, uh, we have something that is rather new, is called Visual Builder. Um, it is very good at building uh, time series information. So what I want to figure out is which instance is having these spikes in memory, or is it all of them? Um, you could do that by SSHing into the boxes, rounding top, and then watching top over some time because to wait for some spike. But that's kind of hard to figure out if you have to m visually inspect that yourself. Uh, what I'm doing instead is, um, I let's say we call this host memory. I don't want the count of documents I'm collo collecting. Uh, by the way, let's check. We are using metric beat here, so we are collecting the metric data. So um, I don't want to count, I want the sum of one specific field, uh, and that is memory usage, um, and you can see we support uh, Docker and Kubernetes, and actually that's not uh, the one I wanted, I want a system memory system.memory. Um, so you can see system memory actual used bytes. That one sounds good. Uh, if I activate that, you can see, okay, we're collecting various pieces of information here. The number is just not very nice. The first thing I want to switch over is to say this is not a number, but this is bytes. Because if you hover over it, now you can see, oh, this is 1.9 gigs. That was pretty hard to see before. And you see we have these weird spikes here, like we have another spike here. Um, so next up, these are all my three instances grouped together. So what I want to do is I want to break this out into my dedicated instances. And for that, I have in a field called beat.name, I have the host name of each instance stored. And here you can see, OK, this is what we're collecting from each instance. So we have a spike here on the front end instance. Everything is flat now. We have a spike here. Um, so the front end instance is doing weird spikes. Now, I would be interested in what is actually causing those spikes. To that, uh, or for that, I want to have another visualization, and let's call this the process memory. And uh, let's say this is red, because, well, why not? Uh, just to make it more distinct. And here, I'm interested in, in the system, uh, in the sum of the process.memory uh, RSS bytes. So this is the the field that contains how much uh, memory each uh, process is using. And you can see, okay, right now we have the aggregation. So what do we have to do to break that down? I'm using the group by where I say terms, and I have the right information here in a process.name field. So basically, I want to group everything together that is coming from one uh, process name. And let's say we want the top 10 processes, which normally should be enough. And you can see a very good overlap between process and what is happening. So you can see here my front-end instance, and the spike is actually caused by Java. Um, what is happening behind the scenes? I have a cron job that is running every five minutes, and it's running a Java process that is allocating memory until it crashes with an out-of-memory exception. Um, so some people might say this is the typical Java program. Um, even though it's kind of like very spiky, like you see it's starting up and then it's dying immediately again. Um, so now we've figured out uh, what is going on uh, here and why we ha might have a resource problem. Uh, so now you can hunt down the Java process and actually kill the bad Java process that is causing your issues. Um, so that is kind of the system view, but let's do something a bit uh, more interesting from an application point of view. Um, so I have my application running here. Um, this is the URL, and this is now your time to do something. Um, everybody who has a phone or a laptop, I need some requests for you, because you are generating the requests that we are using now, since this is all live and unscripted. Um, so if you hit that URL, um, you will be presented uh, by a page, and then you can just click on various links. Um, the one thing that I'm mostly interested in is you can get the 200. Um, which says, hello world, that is not that fun. The second one, get a 200 with a parameter. It has a default parameter of Philip. Um, if you um, add your own name here or something else, we will lock that and we can, if you do enough requests, we will be able to find your name afterwards. So let's say I, I am Peter today. Um, let's add Peter here and then it says, hello Peter, and we're logging that Peter. Um, you can use emojis and various other things. Um, so I think I have an emoji maybe somewhere in my history. Yes. So if you use an emoji, the emoji will also work, and we'll probably find that emoji afterwards in the logs, maybe. Um, use emojis or whatever you, you think would fit in here um, well. And now I want to see what is going on. 
And the first thing where I want to start to see what the system is doing is the network layer. So firstly, I'm interested in the network layer. Uh, I'm heading over to the dashboards because we have another beat collecting network information, which is called packet beat. Um, by the way, if anybody does a denial of service attack on the service, it's OK. Uh, we still we will be able to gen or collect a lot of requests. It's fine. And it can do quite a few requests, actually, since it's a very simple service. Um, so I think we can do like 500 uh, requests per second or something like that normally, depending on which URL you're picking. Um, so next up, what I'm interested in is, um, this is, uh, if I could spell packet, um, packet beat or the network information is very much like Wireshark. Wireshark is fun if you have one instance, but as soon as you have multiple instances, Wireshark is getting a bit painful because you start collecting something here and there, and then you need to combine it to see the overall view of what is going on. So Packet Beat is kind of covering that for you. It's basically collecting network data. It's parsing the network headers and figures out meaningful information from that. So for example, for HTTP, it would know, okay, this is an HTTP request, this is the response. You asked for the URL foobar, which gave you a 404, and that entire thing took 100 milliseconds. And all of that information could just be extracted from the headers. Um, so let's see the overview. Here we're basically having all the requests that you're doing. Um, you can see here, these are your web transactions that you have done. Um, I don't have a database to keep it simple in my system now or a cache, but if you had them, uh, you would see the statistics here as well. You can see this is the number of requests we've been doing over time. Most of them were very fast, like around zero milliseconds. This is this pinkish bar here. You can also see something like percentiles, and you can see the percentiles with the number of requests you were doing are already suffering slightly, because you can see, okay, the uh, 95th percentile is going up here, uh, the 99th percentile is even worse. So 1% of my users had to wait more than a uh, two and a half seconds for my requests. Maybe you should fix that. Um, you can see we do have some errors and some OK messages. And since the colors, I don't like the colors. Let's switch the colors. Set. Let's make these red and these greenish. And then you can see, OK, most of the requests were OK. But here, we, for example, we had a spike with errors. That, that is not great. Um, whereas here, it got much better. You can also see where your errors are coming from. Uh, for example, we had some TLS errors or some HTTP errors. And here, we also have a latency histogram. In the latency histogram, you can see basically, in a, so. This entire thing is for the last 15 minutes. In the last 15 minutes, we had um, no, nearly 4,000 uh, requests, which were very fast, around zero milliseconds. But somebody was very unlucky and had to wait for nearly 12 seconds. Um, not great. Um, and then you could dive into uh, more details here. For example, flows is basically TCP IP information. You can see how many connections do you have. Maybe this is a denial of service attack. Or maybe this is just a conference where a lot of people are doing requests. Um, you will need to figure that out for yourself. You can see who is talking with who. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see how the traffic is distributed. You can also switch over to web transactions. And you can see, oh, we did more web transactions here. Um, so in total, we did 2,200 or so web transactions um, for these URLs. And you can see response codes. You can see the errors. And you can see uh, which URLs were mostly um, called. Um, so that is all nice. But we have similar information somewhere else. Or, by the way, maybe you saw it. It's probably hard to see on your phone. Your requests uh, were HTTPS, so it was encrypted with TLS. Um, why am I still able to see all of this information here? Could I break the encryption? No. I'm kind of cheating. So I have Nginx as my reverse proxy and my Java application behind it. And the traffic between those two is unencrypted. And basically, I sniff the network traffic between the two. So I only take a look at the unencrypted network traffic. Um, so um, that basically means we have Nginx running. And you have probably seen something like this, the access log in Nginx. So let's jump somewhere down here. Um, does that mean anything, or is it just a name? Because I, I had stuff in various languages which I didn't understand, but the audience did. and. Um, OK, I have the feeling, once again, I, I don't understand. But OK, somebody can explain it to me afterwards. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the joy of demos. W whatever you put in there um, happens. Um, and you can see, 
Besides the funny or entertainment uh, point here, um, you can see there's a lot of meaningful information in there. So you have an IP address, you have a date, a timestamp, an HTTP verb, uh, you know uh, you requested uh, some specific URL, um, you have see how many bytes, or that is 200 is the response code, how many bytes were sent, um, and the referral address where this was coming from. And you see something like a user agent. And this contains pretty much all the information that we have in the packet beat information as well. And what, you, what people were doing previously basically were they were using Logstash to collect that file and then uh, parsed uh, that information to make it useful in Kibana. But we figured out at some point um, everybody is doing the same thing and it's uh, not that great to do that every time yourself. Uh, so we have written something that is doing the work for you automatically. It's called a file beat module and there is a file beat module for Nginx for example. And uh, Apache, MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB, and various other services. Basically what this does is it will know on your operating system, which is Ubuntu, um, the log file uh, for the access log is var log nginx access log, and it knows how that pattern looks like. And it will collect that file, parse it, and store the relevant information uh, in Elasticsearch. And we also have a pre-built dashboard uh, to collect that information as well. So let's see. Um, so. These are all the file beat uh, modules and dashboards that we have pre-built for that here. Uh, let's see the Nginx overview um, to see what you have been doing. And the first thing that you have here, you can see we have um, an IP uh, or a geo ad address. How did we get that information? We did a geo IP lookup. And sometimes the data is good and sometimes the data is not that good. Um, so basically, if we zoom in, let's see how good our geo data is today. Because sometimes it's really the right part within the city and sometimes it's just getting the barely the country right. And yeah, today it seems okay, at least okay-ish. And now uh, my... My geography uh, around here is probably failing me. But this looks actually pretty reasonable, right? More or less. If I, yeah. Or at least we pretty much got, got it from where we are. So you can see we have 1,000 requests from here and 1,000 or so uh, from here. So that looks pretty reasonable. Um, we probably can guess where people are from. You can see this is the distribution of requests that you were doing and the response codes. You can see uh, um, <laughs> Filippo from Italy. Um, <laughs> you, you can see who were, was doing a lot of requests, um, uh, how much traffic we were serving, and you can see the breakdown uh, of uh, operating systems and user agents. Um, so it doesn't look like anybody did um, any brute force attack or any denial of service because normally they, I would have JMeter or something like that in there. Um, but that would be fine. Uh, you can also see the access log and the error log. So we have collected that as well. So you can see how much traffic we were serving over time and the actual logs of what we had in there. And you might debug any, any problems. Uh, Denji from Denmark, okay. Um, and yeah, you can, can see all the, the requests that we have been serving here. Um, so that is good and you figure out what is generally going on. What might not be so good is uh, maybe you have clicked on this one here, get a 500 or get a different 500, and then you're getting some error. And you would want to figure out what is the actual error in my application. And what would you generally do is you would have a log file to take a look at that log file, right? Um, so we can do the same, var log, I called the folder apps, and this is the front-end application, and we have a front-end log. I guess this is pretty much what you expect. Um, if I go to the end of that one, you can see here, um, we have one log entry. So again, you can see a date, a timestamp, a log level. You can see what called what, in which class we are. Uh, we have some tracing information. We have a log message, that, like calling something good. And above here, you can see uh, a stack trace. Like every good Java application needs to have a stack trace. Um, so yeah. And now what you would do is you would collect that file and start parsing it manually. But that is generally a very tedious process. Like, because who likes writing regular expressions? Anybody? Good. Because I also don't, and I, I kind of avoid uh, writing them. So what I'm doing instead is um, I have added my custom log appender. So I'm using logpack. And I'm adding a custom log appender that can write out JSON directly. So if I go back to the end, um, this is probably the same message or a similar message. Um, Instead of writing it out as a line, since my application has it in a structured format, we can also write it out in a structured way. So here you can see we have all the information, but directly as JSON. 
And since Elasticsearch is storing JSON again, we can just collect that file with FileBeat, store it into Elasticsearch, and we don't need to do any parsing. So we are saving both resources, and we don't have to write those pesky regular expressions ourselves anymore. Um, so you can just do that, and it's much easier. And to show you what this looks like is uh, now we are heading over to Discover, which contains our uh, dat raw data. And so, for example, for FileBeat, um, in the last 15 minutes, we collected 11,000 or so um, file beat events. Um, this will collect this will contain system logs and the NGINX information. What I'm interested in right now is just the application. So um, I have a custom field which I called application is, and this is now my Java application. So I will just filter down on this Java application. And then out of these 11,000 hits or so, okay, we are down to 4,500. And these are all my uh, Java events that I have collected. Um, for example, what you might be interested in now is you have the severity here and you can see 98 or ne nearly 99% of my requests uh, were uh, infos and then 1.2 uh, errors. So I'm only interested in those errors right now. So I will click on that little plus sign here to filter down on those. And then we will actually see just the errors. So you can see we have applied that filter here, and now we are down to 500 messages or so. On those are just the errors that we have. Um, you can see, okay, Denji from Denmark uh, was here again. Uh, you can see um, the, the actual message, my bad, something went wrong, because I think I have probably that it's a null pointer exception or something like that. You have the entire stack trace here to figure out what was going on. Um, what I'm also doing here is I have this meta information. And that meta information is all enriched automatically. And since this is running on AWS, you can see um, where this is running. So you can see the instance ID, the AWS region, the availability zone, the size of the instance. And then you could figure out maybe all my error logs are coming from one specific instance and something is wrong with that instance. Or you can just search what has been happening on, what, happening on one specific instance. Since we enrich all the events, you can use all of that information to filter down on that. The other thing that can be very useful is uh, we have this so-called stack hash here. And the stack hash, um, what that is, basically we're taking the stack trace, throw out everything that changes between requests, and hash the remainder. And basically what this will give you, one specific uh, stack trace will only always get the same stack hash. And then we can actually use that to aggregate that information to figure out which errors are happening how many times, or which uh, stack traces. Um, for that, we need to build another visualization. Um, this time, let's say we're using a vertical bar chart. Let's try a vertical bar chart. I have, this time, it's the FileBeat information, because FileBeat has collected that. Um, and for the x-axis, what I want here is I want to break that down into a specific term. And the term that I'm interested in is um, the JSON stack hash. And if you run that, let's say I want to have the top 15 stack traces that I have in my system. And if you break that down, you can see this one here, this has happened 100 times exactly. Um, this one here has happened 97 times, etc. So this one here is probably the one you want to uh, figure out first, and then these other ones. And you can see these were just the errors in the last 15 minutes. The other thing you can do is you can break that down even further. So for example, you can say, I want to split this up here. Um, and I want to split this up on a term now. And for example, since we have locked out that name that you have added, I'm curious which were the most common names that ran into an error, um, which is json.name, I think. Uh, and let's say we want the top 25 names here. <laughs> OK. And th these are all the names that you have been using. Um, and now you could see, okay, the user Philip was most affected by all errors, so maybe you, we should apologize to that user and fix that. And you can also say, like, this one here, for example, was, you, or more users were running into this one for whatever reason, and you might want to figure out why. Um, so here you can just get a brief overview of what is happening in your application. And getting that information out just from the raw log is, would be generally very hard. Um, by the way, does anybody have an idea how I could have gotten that JSON name out in a structured format? I was using the MDC logging, the map diagnostic context. So basically, I'm storing structured information in my logs, so I can very easily access that later on. And since I'm using the JSON uh, log appender, I'm keeping that information in a structured format, so I can very easily use that. Um, yeah, if you have questions about that, ask me or check the code afterwards. Okay. 
One other thing we might be interested in is, is my application up or down? For that, we have another dashboard and another beat, and the beat is called Heartbeat. So what Heartbeat is basically doing is it's pinging my services to check if they're up or down. And you can see uh, right now, okay, my application uh, seems to be under some stress because normally this should be up, and I think it's also being, or also working well. But sometimes it's just uh, responding too slowly. So uh, let's see. Uh, let's say we want to see what is actually down. So you can click on that, click the little plus sign, and say, I only want to see what has been down. And you can see, OK, for some reason, it thought Kibana was down at some point, And my front end application also suffered some little downtime over time here. Um, yeah, but we can actually um, stop the entire Java application. So um, I just have. You should never SSH into your boxes to change anything manually. So what I'm doing is I basically have an Ansible script that is restarting my application uh, to do all of that for me. So uh, with that, uh, let's turn on auto refresh. Let's say refresh this page every five seconds, and then you should see uh, this application uh, disappear constantly. Um, and generally, what is happening in the background is just to show you one of the beats in action at some point. Um, even though this is the wrong instance. No? My, okay, my SSH is starting to react very slowly. Let's log into that one, uh, because that is the instance that is running Heartbeat. Um, so just to give you an idea what we have defined here, uh, this is called Heartbeat YAML. Uh, what we have here basically is I'm saying, I'm pinging HTTP or HTTPS, it's the same thing. Uh, it's this endpoint, which is a Spring Boot health endpoint. Um, every 10 seconds, I'm pinging that one with a timeout of 300 seconds, and I'm expecting a 200 to come back. And this is how I ping all my services. I'm also pinging Kibana and Elasticsearch, uh, but yeah, it's mainly for the application. And here you can now see um, the application is pretty constantly down. Below, by the way, you can see how long did it take your uh, application to respond. So most of the requests were up to 300 milliseconds long, but something spiked here. And the different uh, parts here are basically uh, resolving the DNS name, establishing the TCP connection, establishing the TCP connection, and the TLS handshake at the end. So you can see where you're spending your time. And here you have basically a heat map, which are the most common response times. Or you can see most of my requests are answering within 50 milliseconds. The next common one is 150 milliseconds now, and then 250 milliseconds. And you can see where you're basically doing how many responses and how long it takes. Um, by the way, my application should come up automatically afterwards again, uh, because um, what my Ansible script is OK, my Ansible script could not reach the instance. Did anybody start some denial of service attack on my instance? Um, because that I cannot reach um, SSH is kind of unusual. OK, maybe, maybe it works this time. So what is this basically doing is it's stopping my application, waiting for 30 seconds, and then it will restart it again, so it appears magically afterwards again. Um, by the way, if, if you're not sure what, if anybody is doing something suspicious on SSH, we have another dashboard for that, by the way. Um, did anybody try something with SSH? Let's see. Um, so you have the SSH login attempts. Uh, let's say um, now we'll go for the last 12 hours. And you can see these are all the SSH login attempts that people were doing. So you can see the green ones. This is me doing stuff myself. And this is somebody else trying to break into my instance. Uh, you can see when the successful ones happened. And you can see which usernames people tried out. And menu cancel, that is a new one. I've never seen that before. And if you zoom out a bit here, you can also see where your requests are coming from. And today, obviously, it's mostly um, China. Um, normally, there would be a lot of stuff coming from Russia as well. So I'm a bit disappointed in Russia today. Um, because normally, it would be mostly Russia trying to do stuff. But OK. So nobody is trying to brute force our instance too badly, and we can see that. Um, so in the meantime, OK, my application has probably started up again. Um, you can see, OK, my application here was down. Now it's up again, so this should be good. And we'll actually use that information for something else now as well. So once you know your application is up and running, something that could be interesting in it is uh, you probably are interested in some metrics of your application. So you know, at a Spring Boot endpoint, so we have health, uh, which shows you, OK, I'm up. 
Uh, the alternative would be metrics, for example. And metrics, uh, once you log in, if you want to try that, the, you, the credentials are admin and secret. Here you can see basically this is just a, yeah, an HTTP endpoint with the JSON information of, for example, uh, how much or how, what is your garbage collection up to, or how many uh, requests are you serving for good and bad requests, or 200 and 500s and 401s. Like this is basically some easy, simple statistics you might want to collect and store to actually visualize them. And there are two ways in Java generally to do that. Either you can expose an, an HTTP endpoint like that, or you could use JMX. And we support both of them, and I'm actually collecting both of them. Since I've shown you the JSON endpoint here now, um, let's uh, build a quick visualization of what my heap is up to based on the JMX information which I'm collecting. So um, for that, I'm using another uh, visual builder visualization um, to get my visualization of what my heap is up to. Um, let's say we want to build a heap usage in percent of my Java applications. Um, so what we want to do is we don't want to count. Uh, here we want the average over one specific field. And this field I'm interested in is Jolokia. Uh, if I could type, type Jolokia. Uh, metrics, uh, memory heap usage um, used. So this basically shows me over all my applications how, mu how much heap usage I have. Um, you could then again break that down into the terms. Let's say um, uh, we have beat.name. We want to see what that means per instance. Um, you can see here, uh, this is when we restarted the instance and my front-end instance, my front -end instance was partially unavailable at points because either it was overloaded or I was just restarting it. Um, and you can see this is pretty much what you get when you have a Java application. Like you're allocating something, uh, memory usage is growing, you have a garbage collection, uh, it falls down, and then you are allocating until it starts growing again. But this is an absolute value, and I, want, I would be interested in a percentage value now. Um, so what we can do is we can add a second thing here because I need to know how much heap do I even have to calculate the percentage. And for this one, I'm interested in a maximum. And we have a field called Joloki, Jolokia, uh, metrics memory, heap usage, max. Um, which is, you can see, this is uh, 400 max or something like that, um, uh, allocated statically to all the instances. And what I next want to do next is I want to do a calculation of this. So I want to actually uh, calculate something. And for that, I want to use um, the average. This is this field here, which is the the used field, this is my average, and then I want to have a field I call max, which is the max usage. Um, so basically, this average here goes to this variable. And then I want to use that variable and call the variable uh, params.average. So this here basically um, goes to this variable, and then I divided the actual usage divided by the params.max. And then you can see the, the usage in percent. And this is not a number, this is percent, so let's quickly switch that over to um, percent. And then if you hover over that, you can see how much heap usage you actually use, or how, how many percent of your heap you're using, and if you're getting close to the limit. Um, one other thing that might be interesting in is, is if somebody changes something and stuff breaks in your application. You probably know that when you run around your office and shout like who changed something because something is broken in the application. Um, and we want to avoid that. So what we're doing here is, um, it's, um, what I'm doing here is, when I stopped my application, it actually wrote out an event to Elasticsearch that it changed something. As long as you do everything through an automated system, it can always collect that information that something happened. And I want to uh, visualize that information. Um, so what I can do here is, we have these annotations here, and in the annotations I can say, I want to get that information from, uh, the index is called events, um, just to show you what this looks like. Um, this is not what I want, I want to get an events uh, search. So here, basically, you can see this is one event I have written out. So this was um, the user Philip did with Ansible something on that host uh, to that application at that timestamp. And that we can use to actually draw out and track who has been changing stuff over time in your application. And I have that for every change to the operating system or any configuration change. I also have that to every deployment operation. So you can actually figure out who has been doing something. Um, so what I want is I want user, host, and application. These are the fields that I'm interested in. So you can see here we have 
user host application. Let's take this, those three uh, to actually annotate my graph. And then I can say a user ran application on host. Um, and then you can see here, this is when I actually, that is not very nice that you crash now, but okay. Uh, this one, and now it killed my visualization, but anyway, um, this one would uh, show you in your annotation then, okay, this is uh, where you have run your, your program, and that is what happened. Um, okay, so this is all nice. The one thing that you might be interested in is, if you run your application here, um, is if you get one of these slow requests down here, for example, the slow 500 where you're waiting and you're waiting and suddenly you get an error and you want to figure out where is stuff breaking in my application because this is one of the worst problems that to have if one of your user comes to you and says like, oh, your application is slow and especially if it's distributed, you have a very hard time figuring out where is something happening and where is something slow. For that, we're using tracing and I'm using Sipkin for that. And what that does basically, and let's quickly um, switch back to some slides for that. So what I have there is the library we're using in Spring Boot is called Sleuth, which means detective um, in British English. Um, and what that Sleuth is doing is it's basically adding that information to all my events and log files. And you can see that the second line, basically, this square bracket with some very randomly looking strings, this is what we're using for the tracing. So what you basically get is I'm storing the application so that I know which application this is happening on. I have a trace ID. So when you do a request and the request hits your application for the very first time, it gets this trace ID. And the trace ID is kept uh, throughout the entire call. And then we have a span ID that is basically a method call. So the trace ID, you can follow that one request as it calls all the other services in your application that you need. And the span ID is uh, that then one method call. And then in the end, the true flag basically means send this to Sipkin. So basically, we're sending that tracing information to a centralized service, uh, which is running on monitor. So this is Sipkin. You can see Sipkin is being developed by backend developers and not frontend developers, um, but it does get the job done. So um, if I run that one again, and you can see it takes some time, or yeah, it takes some time, and at some point you get an error. Um, so what you can do is you can then run find traces, and this will basically show you the slowest calls. And you can see, um, for example, this one here spent 1.9 seconds in three calls. Where did it spend its time? If I click on that, it will actually show me. So we called the method call, then we called slow, and then we called slow call. But slow call was actually very fast. It only took 44 milliseconds. Where here, for example, it took uh, 1.4 seconds or so to call that one. And the overall call was 1.9 or nearly two seconds. And this is basically the call uh, hierarchy that you have. And you can see um, where stuff is happening in the front end or in the back end application and with which methods or calls are being executed. And then you can look at those to figure out what is actually slow and where do you need to debug that something is not working the way you want it to debug. And I can basically make it slightly larger as well. So for example, here you can actually click on that one. It will give you all the detailed timing information, like where did it spend its time? So, okay, the client sent something, the server received something that was like, the difference here is pretty minor, uh, but then the server uh, sent back the response and the client received it. There has been a lot of time passing in between here. And why is this slow? Um, I'm adding some structured information here again to make this a bit more clearer. Uh, basically, I'm doing a random sleep. That's where it's spending its time. So this is doing a, a sleep for, and this is random, so it's up to one second, I think. So this has been sleeping for 500 milliseconds now. And here you have all the relevant information of where it's spending its time. What you can also do is, um, if you, you have uh, a plugin for Chrome and one for Firefox, which I think is still better or something like that, uh, but for Chrome it's definitely there, you can basically add your Sipkin server and let's go back to this page here and say, let's get a slow call, uh, which gives you a 200 with some background tasks. So this might take a while and you can see, oh, it's slow. To actually figure out what this call is doing uh, with this plugin, uh, it will give, give you the trace ID of that specific call. You can click on that and then it will take you to that specific trace. And then you can see um, where it is spending its time. Um, to actually debug that yourself. Um, if you want to see, for example, an error message, um, 
here we could take a look at an error message here. You can basically see where the error is happening. So this one called bad, and the bad is then giving you the error message. And you can see, okay, here, this is the actual my bad, something went wrong. You have the, the log message and everything. So this one is giving you all that is going wrong in there. Okay. Cool. Uh, we did that. We did that. Um, yes, let's do some slides. Um, okay. Other stuff that we're not covering today. So um, there are alerts, uh, which look something like this. For example, this is a threshold-based one, where you can say, for my heap usage, um, you can see it's probably very hard to see, but you have Jalukia metrics memory. You have a heap usage, and you can define a threshold. If you use more heap than x, we want to be alerted. Um, you could also do anything that you can express in an Elasticsearch query, and any data that you have in there, you can use as the input. Then define a condition, like if this is greater than, or if there's more occurrences, or if it has been uh, down for some time or whatever, uh, then you want to take some action. Uh, the other thing what we have is called machine learning, though that is only available on premise with a commercial license, um, is basically anomaly detection of time series data. Um, and here you can see basically, even though it's very hard to see, um, the blue line is what the number of requests you have. And then there is a, a light blue band around that, which is basically the expected value. So this will learn over time what are the expected values at some specific point in time. And then these red dots are basically an anomaly because um, that blue band, um, the blue band is somewhere up here, but you fell kind of like way through that blue band. And this is then an anomaly. And then it could alert you because generally what you have is oftentimes when you have real users on your website, you have like a daily pattern. So for example, down here you can see these are five weekdays. These are two weekends, and then you have five weekdays again, and then weekend, weekdays, and these are like patterns. What is very hard is like to define a certain threshold, what is normal and what is not normal, because generally, for the weekends, you will need to have a threshold like here, but for the weekdays, you would need to have an upper bound like here. And that doesn't tell you much, uh, like, how is this developing over time, and what are, how close am I to what I should have, generally. Um, the other thing that we are currently working on integrating is we recently bought an APM company, or almost a year ago, APM for Application Performance Monitoring. And we're currently in the process of building the, the Java agent, because we have Node and Python and Go and Ruby. And Java is currently alpha code, but we're getting there. And what you can see here is basically you have the calling information. So you can see some, some app.js was called here, some other method was called here, some, some method here. And next to that here, this one basically says, OK, this call here, that was um, like 20%, or actually this one here, 21% of the time I spent in this one call here. And this is the code behind it. And these are the people who actually committed that code. And then you know who to complain to, um, or if it's buggy. And we're currently writing the the APM agent for Java, which is also open source. So then you can include all of that tracing information directly in Kibana and collect it into one single stack. Um, so to wrap up, since we're down to three minutes, um, I always compare the entire stack a bit to Lego. We have all these building blocks, but you need to do some assembly. The big advantage of that is you can build whatever you want. So if you want to include some business metrics or some sales information or whatever makes sense for your use case, you can very easily integrate that into the stack because it's not just built for one specific purpose, but it's more of an open system where you can plug in all the relevant information. And the biggest advantage is generally to combine all the information into one system to see not only like just the logs or just the metrics or just the traces, but to combine them and probably combine them with like how much are we selling or how many visitors are coming to my website overall. And just to get like the overall picture, everybody can have their own dedicated dashboards then, but it's good to have the possibility to get like an overall view of what your system is doing. Um, yeah, these are all the, the things that we have covered. I think you've seen that. Um, if you want to play around with that yourself, I have under dashboards, um, you can just use the dashboards. You cannot, so that is Kibana, the Kibana dashboards. You cannot delete any data. You cannot build any, not your own visualizations, but you can use all the pre-built dashboards. Uh, and if you're interested in the code and all the configurations, that's, yeah, on my GitHub account, the microservice dash monitoring. I will tweet out the slides and the link to that afterwards anyway. Um, but yeah, take a picture if you want to take a look at that. And everybody done with the pictures? This is, this is probably one of the slides. Yeah, you take a picture of that slide, and from, from the GitHub account, you can find everything else. Um, done? Good. Um, 
No, this, this, this will be like a, a never ending deadlock, I guess. Um, so um, if you have been too slow, I'm sorry. Um, so I have a bunch of stickers here. If you want stickers, grab them afterwards. And we have two minutes left for questions. Are there any questions here now? Anybody? Don't be shy. I have a very hard time seeing anything. Because if there are no questions, we can also see uh, if anybody asks something on Slido.